Amen. Let's have a word of prayer and we'll get into the lesson. My Father, I pray, Lord, that you give me the gift of teaching now and give me wisdom in the Word of God and give me wisdom, Father, to speak these wonderful words of life. In thy holy name, amen. I would like to welcome the couple here in the center. They're from Chattanooga. Came up to see us this morning. The folks over here from Mississippi came up to see us, and we're glad to have them. Amen. You get by and shake hands. Let them know you, you appreciate them being here. We want folks to feel welcome when they come in like that and into the house of God. Turn to John 630, uh, 663 this morning with me, please. We're going to pick up a second lesson now on the New Age Bible and uh, Satanic Luciferian uh, productions today. John chapter number 6 and verse 63. The scripture says, It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. All right, you remember that from last week I told you that no one made an attempt to eat the body of Christ, did they? It's obvious he did not refer to eating his physical flesh. And he said, Except you eat my flesh, drink my blood, you have no part in me. But it's obvious that he was not talking about cannibalism. It went deeper than that. But I want to show you another take on that same scripture this morning, John 6, verse 63. It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. Now watch carefully. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. That's what you just read, right? Yeah. All right. The words, therefore, become very important because the words convey the spirit. Wrong words, wrong spirit. Right words, right spirit. Right Bible, right spirit. Wrong Bible, wrong spirit. That's the issue. That's what's going on here. And uh, to corrupt God's word or mess with his word is a very important thing with God. Look at Revelation. Last few, uh, last few verses here. Now look, at the, look over here in Revelation 22. Verse number... 18, Revelation 22, 18. For I testify to every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. This book is a reference not just, not just to the book of Revelation, but to the book as a whole, as a complete, because it is the book. Although it has 66 books, it is still just one book. So he said, Heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things... God shall add to him the plagues that are written in this book. If any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life, out of the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. Frank Logsdon, who was on the NIV committee uh, that produced the NIV Bible, before he died, confessed from his soul, I fear that we are in great error. And here's the reason he said that, because he knew he'd been messing with the Word of God. You see, it's one thing for me to get up here and preach what I believe, and you, if you agree with it or don't agree with it, but it's my Word. It's a sermon I've preached, tapes and all that and this and that. Uh, they proliferate all over the place. You can find them here, there for 2,000 years. That's not the Word of God. But when you have a Bible and hold it in your hand and say, this is the Word of God, then you've made a big statement. And so when someone produces something that is called the Word of God, that is passed from generation to generation, you have just laid your neck on the block. You better hope what you've got right there is right. You know what I mean? Martin Luther was very careful about that when he translated the German Bible, which was, predates the King James Bible. He was very careful to see to it that he put into the language of the German people God's Word. And he, what he used to do that was the Greek text of Erasmus, and Erasmus is one of the five Greek texts that compi comprise what we call the Textus Receptus. Uh, let me see, Stephanus, Elzever, Colonnaeus, Erasmus, and what's the fifth one? I can't think of it right now. But these five Greek texts are what we use today to give us the, the, uh, the received text. The received text comprises over 5,000 parts, pieces, to the what's called the Textus Receptus, and the corrupted text is a very small part of it. The Alexandrinus, the or the Vaticanus, 
the Sinaiticus, the Washingtonius, I think there's about five of them, along with portions and pieces here and there, which is a very small part, small, very, very small, that disagrees among themselves in thousands of places. Now think about what I just said. These texts disagree in thousands of places among themselves. And they're going to take that as an authority over the vast majority of the texts that are used to, to produce your King James Bible. Now that's insanity. <laughs> that's insanity. Of course, scholarship says, well, these are the oldest texts, which gets into textual criticism and all of that, and that's not the scope of this message. But what I'm trying to show you today is that the issue of the translation and transmission of Scripture is not a simple thing. It's not a simple thing. It's not, uh, it's not cut and dried, black and white, uh, laid out where anybody can simply understand it. There's a lot of variables involved in this thing. But generally speaking, generally speaking, there are two lines of manuscripts, and they are definitely distinct from each other, two lines of manuscripts that produce your Bible. One is what's called the Alexandrian text, and the other one is the received text, or the Syrian type text. And the Bible says that they were first called Christians in where? In Syria, Antioch of Syria, exactly. So you have the Syrian type text and you have the Alexandrian text. And the problem you get into with the Alexandrian text, I'm going to point out to you this morning, is that the Alexandrian text was definitely, definitely influenced by the corruption of North Africa. How many times, you know, have I mentioned North Africa, how that, uh, how that uh, Philo of Alexandria tried to merge uh, Neoplatonism with, with Moses and it was the hotbed of Gnosticism, Nag Hammadi, 1947, where they dug up all these texts. North Africa is definitely a hotbed of Gnosticism, corruption, uh, New Age movement, long before it was ever called the New Age movement. All this stuff is, is being, is giving, has been given birth in North Africa. If you remember in the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah the prophet, when he, when he uh, chastened Israel, for going into North Africa. And when they went into North Africa, that was sin number one. Sin number one. That was go to go into North Africa. That was sin number one. Sin number two. Jeremiah uh, blasted them. He said, you have baked cakes to the queen of heaven. Remember that? Yeah. Remember that? In Jeremiah. And so not only had they sinned in going into Egypt in the first place, never to go into Egypt again. But they went into Egypt. So... They were, uh, they, they were chasing for that, but then they were chasing for baking cakes to the queen of heaven. Now, uh, how many of you know what uh, the Virgin Mary is called in the Roman Catholic Church? She's called the queen of heaven. Now, if I were a Roman Catholic, I'd say to myself, now, hold on a minute. <laughs> I mean, I, maybe I can think of a better term than queen of heaven, because that's exactly what Jeremiah you see, the queen of heaven goes far more than simply calling Mary the queen of heaven. The queen of heaven gets into Sophia. It gets into Lucifer. It gets into the monad that Plato talked about. It gets into this demiurge of the Old Testament, who Jehovah, the God of the Old Testament, is a demiurge. He's a created God and doesn't know it. And so the Old Testament scriptures are shot through with tribal theology of Israel. It's tribal theology. It's the way they understood things to be, which was far from perfect and far from true. They were ignorant people. Now, you understand I don't believe any of this? And some of you are looking at me funny, like, like, is that what you believe, preacher? No, I don't believe that. I'm trying to tell you that's what they believe. That's what these college professors are teaching young men when they come into the Bible college. They're telling them that the Old Testament Scripture, they have a what's called the uh, School of Higher Criticism developed in Germany. It's called the Graf, Graf Wellhausen Theory. That, for example, the book of Genesis is written by no fewer than four or five different people. Not Moses. Four or five different people. And a, no, and a young man goes into a Bible college and his head's pumped full of this garbage. And by the time he leaves Bible college, he doesn't believe a word of the Bible. Instead of believing the Bible, he's turning to, he's turning to theosophy. He's turning to, uh, he's turning to hedonism. He's turning to humanism. He's turning to everything under the sun because he doesn't believe the Bible anymore. He's, they have destroyed his faith in the Scriptures. But if you remember the two on the road to Emmaus when the Lord Jesus had arisen from the dead... He didn't go to uh, Plato, and Plato was extant at that time. 
He didn't go to Plato. Where did he go? He took them to the Scriptures. And the Bible said, starting with Moses and the prophets, he began to expound to them the things in the Scriptures pertaining to himself. And they said, didn't our, our hearts burn within us when he opened to us the Scriptures? And the Apostle Paul said, Timothy, from a child thou hast known the holy Scriptures which are able to make thee wise in the salvation. If I can't hold a Bible in my hand and say, that's the book. Don't mess with my book. <laughs> Me, I'm fallible. Oh, i got all kinds of warts. But the book, the book's perfect. If I can't hold a book in my hand and say that, then I'll ask you a simple question. It begs the question. Well, if you don't have a book in your hand that you can say, this is God's Word, and I believe it from cover to cover, if you don't have a book you can say that, what do you have? What do you have? You say, oh, I've, got stock. I've got scholarship, so you trust men. That's like a Catholic who trusts his priest in his church to save his soul. That's why they hold that sword of Damocles over their head, that if they do anything wrong, if they step out of line, that uh, they can be excommunicated from that church. And if they're excommunicated from that church, what happens? They go to hell. That puts the salvation of every Roman Catholic in the hands of an institution and men. Right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I don't want that. I want part of that. My salvation is not in the hands of a man. Hallelujah to God. It's in the hands of the Almighty. All right. Now, I mean, that's the philosophy. That's the reproach to it. What I just gave you right there, the, that's the whole idea. That uh, I mean, that's my position. My position is very clear. I'll state it again. As far as I'm concerned, the Holy Bible, the King James Version, is without error, perfect from cover to cover, and has never been proven to have a, have a, have a mistake or error in it. And the challenge has been out there for a long time, and people have offered great sums of money to anybody who can come along and prove it's got an error in it. And they've never had to pay off, and the reason they haven't is because you can't do it. You can't prove it. So anyway, the point of this is, all right, if the King James Bible is so different from the other Bibles, and it is, folks, if it is so different from the other Bibles, then what's the point in all these other translations? All right. Now, how many of you ever heard of Westcott and Hort? Many of you have. Certainly you have. They, in the 1800s, they decided that they needed a new translation of the Bible. So they had what's called the Revision Committee. And the Revision Committee was uh, essentially... Uh, uh, governed by Westcott and Hort. Now, these men are both Bible scholars, no question. Uh, biblical linguists, no question. Very intelligent men, no question. I've got a commentary that is written by Westcott on some of the books of the Bible, and it's remarkable at the insight that he has into many things in the New Testament. That only shows you how subtle Satan can be when he begins to move uh, with, with, uh, with, with, with his uh, deception. Uh, no question about it. And we're not talking about a couple of dunces here. We're talking about very smart, very intelligent men. But they got into the revision committee. Here's what they did in the 1800s. Their point was, well, you know, we've got the majority text. But we believe that the Alexandrian text is superior to it. And we're going to use the Alexandrian text to create a new Greek testament. Or a, Greek, a new Greek, uh, you know, a, the, King, the Bible's translated from Greek, so we're going to produce like Erasmus did or Elzevin and the rest of them. We're going to produce a Greek Testament, and from that, then we can translate into whatever language we need to. And so instead of using the King James Receptus, Texas Receptus, they used the Alexandrian text. And when they did that, they laid the groundwork for every single translation that has come since then. And the granddaddy, of course, is the revised version of 1889, I think it is, or somewhere along in there. And then all the rest of them that followed. All right, and here's what happens. When stuff like this starts, it's never right in your face. It's usually a gradual thing. And the gradual development of doctrine has been remarkable. For now, I'm going to mention some things to you that are in these new Bibles to show you how that they have, they have changed the very meaning of scriptures and the change that they've made is profound. And now you live in 2015. Now, if I'd been talking about this in, in 1985, it might not have been so profound. But today, it's in your face. All this stuff is. New Age movement is in your face. Occultism is in your face. You're looking at it every day of your life. You're living in an occult world. You're living in a barbaric world. And you're living in the midst of people who don't believe. 
And so you can look at it now in retrospect, and you can see the devilment when it started and what it's produced. Just give you a few of them this morning. But what I'm trying to say is this, simply. I want to put it as simple as I know how. The new Bibles are laying the groundwork for the church of today to accept the Antichrist. You first accept the Spirit. The Apostle said to the church at Thessalonica, uh, if you receive another Spirit. You first receive the Spirit, then you receive the being attached to the Spirit. That's the way it works. When you receive the Holy Ghost witness of the Lord Jesus Christ, then you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. When He, the Spirit of truth, is coming to the world, He'll guide you into all truth. Did you notice over there where it says that He will convince the world of adultery because they believe not on Me? Is that what it says? That's not what it says. There is not one word in there that says He's going to convince the world of specific sins. He's going to convince the world of the sin of rejecting the Lord Jesus Christ. You can repent of adultery and still go to hell. You sure can. Repenting of adultery doesn't save your soul. What saves your soul is receiving the Lord Jesus Christ. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son hath not life. Now, first of all, it's Lucifer. Isaiah fourteen twelve. In Isaiah chapter number 14, verse 12, O Lucifer, how art thou fallen from heaven? All right, now you know that text very well. All right. Now I'm going to give you some material this morning that I got from Brother Timothy Morton. The reason I'm using his work is because he's got a lot of good stuff laid out here, and it takes time to lay all these points out one after another. And I believe in giving credit where credit's due. This man is Timothy S. Morton. His website is preservedwords.com. You might want to get on there. He's got a lot of good stuff. And here's what he says about Lucifer. Number one, most modern Bibles remove Lucifer from Isaiah 14, 12 and replace it with morning star. This implies that Christ, the bright and morning star, is the subject of the passage, falling from heaven into hell. Like the New Age religion, they teach that Lucifer is not Satan or evil. The NIV says Lucifer in Luke 10, 18, where it should be Satan. Satanas in Greek. The NASV places the reference 2 Peter 1.29 in Isaiah 14.12, implying the passage refers to Christ. Let me tell you what all that means. The Christ. The Christ is a liberal statement that has to do with some kind of an anointing, some kind of a special anointing that came on an earthly man who's no different from any of the rest of us, just a sinner like all the rest of us. But this anointing came on him, stayed on him, and then left him. Just like it can come on you, stay on you, and leave you. So what's that done for the Lord Jesus Christ? That stripped him of his deity. But here's the subtle way they do that. Now this is important. This is the subtle way they do that. They confound the identity of the Lord Jesus Christ with Lucifer. They make him interchangeable. Lucifer means light bearer. It's a Latin word. Strange, isn't it, that it shows up in an Old Testament Hebrew text. Lucifer is Latin, and it means light bearer. All right? You remember what I told you about Plato going way back in the old golden age of Greece when Plato taught about the monad or the one, capital O-N-E, this great spirit that's up there, that is the good thing, okay? That's the good thing. Everything else is an emanation of the good thing. And what do you mean emanation? It means that it comes forth like Lucifer, Sophia, Jesus, Buddha, on and on and on the list goes. They are lower subservient to the good one. All right? The Old Testament God, Jehovah, is a demiurge that was created by Sophia. Remember the Queen of Heaven. The Old Testament God, Jehovah, is a demiurge, in other words, a lesser God. 
Seems like they had a movie out not too long ago. It said Children of a Lesser God. You remember that? Too, not long ago, thirty years ago, probably. <laughs> I lose <laughs> lose time, but when I saw that, I thought that's quite a term. Children of a lesser God. You see, you get in the you get in you get into the levels of Godhood. All right. As a Christian, I believe that there is one Almighty, eternal Being who is the creator and sustainer of the universe, that he is an invisible being that made himself known to mankind when he incarnated himself in human flesh and went to a cross, died, and on the third day was raised from the dead and went back to the right hand of the Father and sat down and finished his work. He is not part of anything. He is absolutely and completely self-sustained, self-efficient, self-contained. He lives by and abides by himself. He's Almighty God. Everything else, everything else came into existence by the direct act of that Creator God. All right, now that's what I believe. Now, uh, the occult world believes that the God of the Old Testament is a demiurge, a created God, He's a tribal God. He's a, he's a lesser God. Look at him getting jealous. Look at him talking about sending people to hell. He's a mean God. He's not a good God. And all this stuff they begin to heap on the God of the Old Testament, Jehovah. And believe me, folks, the occult world is built on that idea. Therefore, therefore, Lucifer predates the Old Testament God, according to these people. Uh, now you see where it's starting to make some sense? Lucifer goes way back, which is a direct emanation of the one, the bonad, and there Lucifer shows up, the light bearer. What a term. You remember what uh, uh, Pike said in his, in his Morals and Dogma? Uh, Albert Pike, in the Masonic Lodge, he said his Morals and Dogma. He said that Lucifer, he said, what a term for a fallen being. To paraphrase him. In other words, he put doubt in your mind right off the bat saying, I mean, would you call a devil Lucifer? You know, would you call this horned thing with this cloven hoof, this, this wicked, vile creature, the devil, would you call him Lucifer? Why, of course not. Lucifer is a good being. He's a beneficial being. He's a useful being. He's the one who shows us the way. He's the light bearer. See the point? See the argument? See how it fits together? And this is what these people are trying to say to you. All right. Why is that in the NIV? Why is that in these new Bibles? Think about that for a minute. The King James Bible never, con never makes a, uh, uh, mixes you up, mixes up the, uh, uh, d d it differentiates, it makes it clear. The King James Bible makes it very clear that there's a difference between the Lord Jesus Christ and the devil. And the, and, the, and the King James Bible makes it very clear that there is a direct connection between Lucifer and Satan. That's what the King James Bible does. So why would these new Bibles come along and, and, and change it? You know, what do you say, well, it's a better translation. Based on what? <laughs> I mean, that gets into manuscript evidence and all the other stuff, and that's a separate thing altogether. But it's not. For example, if you take where well, you have the Greek word satanos, Satan's a Hebrew word, carried over into Greek, transliterated, satanos, all right? Satan. How in the world would you translate that into Lucifer? See, how would you put Lucifer where Satan is? That's a complete change. That's somebody intervening and saying what they want to say with the text. That's what's going on. All right. So point number one. Point number one. These Bibles, these Bibles have an agenda. Now, the people who did it may, may not be privy to it, but that, that, that's not necessary. That's like a mule carrying a load. They may not have a clue what they're carrying, but they're carrying it anyway. Right? It's the one who put the load on the mule that knows what's going on. Exactly. So why do, they, why do they do that? Because they want to confound in the mind of people today the identity of Christ and Satan. Now remember, 
the Christ. If you ever hear a preacher who constantly goes on about the Christ, the Christ did this, the Christ said that, you're listening to a rank liberal that no more believes in the absolute deity of the Lord Jesus Christ than a dog. He believes in some kind of an anointing that came in there. I believe in the anointing too, but not the way he does. His anointing and my anointing are entirely two different things. So if all you're hearing from some guy is the Christ, the Christ, the Christ, the Christ, that's no Christian. He doesn't have a clue who he is. All right, so what do we got now? We've got a Bible out here in the bookstores that people go to and they buy. And, uh, and these Bible programs, good night. I've got a Bible program that's got probably 30 translations on it. And I don't know how many are out there. <laughs> good night. I mean, what after 50? What are you, what are you going to do? <laughs> I mean, who has time? To, and I don't read them. You know, I mean, they sell these Bible translations over these Bible programs. Oh, do you need to get this latest version that shed, shed, shed so much light upon the text? And I, I said, give me an old commentary, about 200 years old, written by a Bible-believing Christian who had real communion and fellowship with God. Let me hear what he's got to say about the text. I don't care what your new Bibles have to say. That's what, it, that's what you need. Really? As I've said before, the old stuff, that's the cheapest stuff, too, because they don't put any value in the old stuff. You know, whoever the latest Christian celebrity happens to be, whatever books he's pumping out, like Mr. So-and-so out in Houston, you know, he's pumping one right out. If you've read one, you've read them all. <laughs> but he pumps another one out, and they run to the bookstore to buy it. And, they, and after they've read about halfway through the thing, they think, man, didn't he say that before? You're just saying it a different way. You don't get anything. But get yourself an old commentary. An old one. Somebody like Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown. Get something like that. And I don't agree with everything in there, but it's good. These men love the Lord. Or Bingle, as I told you about. Alfred Bingle. Or Meyer, another German. Get these old commentaries and start reading what they've got to say. You'd be amazed at some of the light that God's given them that can help you in understanding the Scripture. But as has been said, the greatest commentary on the Bible is the Bible itself. Across reference material, concordance, and all that. All right. That's Lucifer. Number two, this is a big one. They remove the male pronouns from many verses. He, him, etc. Now watch this. And refer to God or Christ as one. Capital O-N-E. Why would they do that? You know why? That's who Plato's talking about. The one. The one. That's who he's talking about. Why would they do that? Why would they take he, a personal pronoun, and replace it with one, capital O, and he, not just one lowercase, but one uppercase, N-E. Why the capitalization? Why the uppercase? Anytime it's capitalized like that, what's it mean? Deity. Deity. But deity with a different identity. One. Number three. They capitalize virgin or put the in front of it to make it a proper name, implying Mary's perpetual virginity. Mary was a virgin, absolutely, virgin daughter of Zion, not the virgin of heathen religions. Mary, Mary, not the mother of our Lord Jesus Christ, but the Mary of religion became the queen of heaven in North Africa. Okay? She became the queen of heaven in North Africa. In the 1200s, all over France, all over France, they went into a, they went into a building program, unparalleled in history. They built these huge cathedrals all over France. They're beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. These cathedrals have labyrinths inside them. They also have vortexes inside them. What's a vortex? A vortex is something on this earth that cannot be measured with a, mic with a microscope or any kind of a meter that we have, yet it is producing an energy field, a vortex. These are present in these cathedrals. In plainer words, they have tapped into a spiritual source, a spiritual power back in the 1200s in these cathedrals in France. Someone went, took the time and put the effort into laying out a map of France, laid it out, 
and then put the dots on there of all these cathedrals. Now think about what I'm saying. They laid the map out, then they put the dots on here. Each dot represented a cathedral where it's located on the map. Then you can take that map with the dots on it and raise it up into the sky and superimpose it on a constellation. Now that's pretty heavy stuff. <laughs> that's pretty heavy to think that, first of all, we've got the constellation, but secondly, we've got the presence here to build these things and be able to secure the land and find the locations where you can build the cathedrals where it matches this. God said in Jeremiah, don't be dismayed with the signs of the heavens. In the book of Psalms, he said, I give you the heavens, the signs of the heavens as a witness, as a testimony. When you look up into the stars, do exactly what Abraham did. Abraham, you see the stars? Yes, Lord. He said, I'm going to make your, sa your, your, your seed as the stars of heaven. And I'm going to also make them as the sand upon the seashore. An earthly seed and a heavenly seed. God created everything that's up there. There's a witness everywhere of his majesty. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Night after night uttereth speech. There's something going on that blows the mind. But keep this in mind. Satan has a lot of time. And when he begins to lay the groundwork for something, he'll take generations, centuries, to get done what he intends to do. You're watching. You're living right now in 2015. You're living right now in the confluence of all of this stuff coming together and dovetailing and beginning to unfold before your very eyes. You're watching it as it comes to pass. This is why so many prophecy teachers are sticking their head on the chop block. And they're good men. Everybody got so worked up over September. And I warned you about it. But all of this stuff was coming together in September. And everybody got worked up. And they're good men. No doubt about that. They love the Lord. And it's easy to get caught up in this stuff because there is so much happening. So much that's going on. And it's so easy right now. To believe, good night, man. I mean, all this stuff's happening. The Lord's got to be coming back tomorrow. Well, it's easy to get into that. But we don't know when the Lord's coming back. I wouldn't be a bit surprised, though, if he didn't come back in my lifetime. Of course, that depends on how long i got left down here, right? <laughs> but I do fir firmly believe he's coming back. All right? So what you get from the cathedrals in France, what you get from the cathedrals in France is a knowledge that surpasses earthly understanding. Now, this brother right here, Brother uh, Tony Hopkins, has a set of videos about the pyramids. And it is remarkable. I've watched a couple of them. It is remarkable at how much was known by the people who built the pyramids. It'll actually blow your mind as to what they're discovering, and they continue to discover about what these people knew that built pyramids. In plain words, they had, a, they had a connection with knowledge that from all intent and purpose was not earthly. It had to come from somewhere else. It had to come from somewhere else. So uh, we have a time and a place and a calling, and we have a second advent, and I don't know when he's coming back, but I know he's coming, and I hope you're ready for him. You've got Bibles now. Most people have different translations in their homes. You've got Bibles, and you've got them on the programs, that are laying the ground foundation and the groundwork for the reception of the Antichrist. The church will have to reject the true Christ to accept the Antichrist. Now, let me tell you how that anti is used. That's important. Most of the time... The simple understanding of anti means I'm against something. See, I'm against it. All right, anti. But that's not always the case, the meaning of the word. Sometimes the word means that it is set in contradistinction to, in plainer words, to show you the difference between, that it is a deceptive mockery of the real. That 
figures to me more for the Antichrist than simply being against the Christ, the true Christ. The Antichrist is a false Christ. He's a pseudo-Christ. He's a, he's, a, he's, a, uh, he's a deceptive Christ. What does it say in 2 Thessalonians number 2, chapter 2? He said, another spirit and another Christ. There's a true Christ and a false Christ. All right. So the new Bibles are laying the groundwork for that. They butcher the Lord's Prayer in Luke 11, 2. Uh, in uh, the seventh point he makes is they replace mystery Babylon with just Babylon, changing the reference from a religious institution to a location. Uh, let's get on down here. He's got, some, he's got some good notation on down here further. Here's a good one. They call devils demons. Devils are always evil, but to a new ager, demons are not. Now, anytime you mention the word demon to a Christian, what do you, response do you get? Don't have anything to do with it. Not to a new ager. Not to Plato. Not to the Greek philosophers. To the Greek philosophers, for the most part, not universally, but for the most part, a demon was a good thing to have because it was a source of knowledge. And they are knowledgeable. Demons are smart. And they are knowledgeable. So, when we come along today, the King James translators found the Greek word daimonion or diamon. That's, the, that's how it says it in Greek. And they, and they don't translate it. The New Agers don't. They just simply bring it out of Greek and put it into English and say demon. That's all it is. But the King James translators found diamonion and they translated it and called it a devil. Is there anything wrong with that? No. If you ever let a demon start messing around your family, you'll know you've got been a hold of the devil. You better believe it. I don't need demon. I don't have anything to do with the demon. I want no part of him. All right. So scholarship comes along and they say, ah, oh, see how stupid these poor old King James people are and these poor old fundamental Baptists are. Don't they know that there's just one devil? How many ever heard that before? Just one devil? There's just one devil. All right. The word devil is a generic term. So what do you mean by that? A generic term is like taking... Uh, uh, a generic term refers to the, to the substance of what it is, not necessarily the brand of what it is. See? That's what a generic term means. You can all, most of the prescriptions that your doctor prescribes for you, it'll have a brand name on it. And most people simply know the brand name. But you can get a generic equivalent to that, and it's the same thing, it just doesn't have the brand name attached to it. That's generic. All right? The word devil is a generic term. It simply means a wicked, vile, contentious spirit. That's what a devil is. Is there more than one wicked, vile, contentious spirit? Absolutely. Absolutely. There are many devils. There's only one Satan. There's just one Lucifer. And Lucifer and Satan are one and the same. But you see, the new Bibles like to mess with your mind. They like to mess with, like, to, like we know something you don't know, so we're going to hook you and pull you in, so you're going to become one of our disciples, and we're going to show you how smart we are and how good our scholarship is. And so instead of translating demon into devil, they, put, they, they just leave it untranslated and call it a demon. And therefore, if you're a new ager, and they're preaching today, and believe me, you're going to get it. You're getting it right now. They're calling evil good and good evil. They're turning everything upside down. And people are, people are obsessed with demons. And that's exactly why. Because they're changing everything. Uh, here's another good one, too. Uh, the, uh, let's see. Let's go back up here. They teach the devils, demons... Uh, 
Here's a subtle thing. They teach that there's another means of eternal life. John 6, 68. The is removed. Other places where the is removed, changing the meaning of the verse. On and on he gives examples. I'll give you a copy of this if you'd like to have it. We'll get our secretary to make some. It'd be very interesting for you to take the time to get this and go through all these scriptures because it's loaded with them. I can't, there's no way in the world in a 45-minute lesson I can read all these scriptures. Uh, in the point 22 is that they call God a God. And that goes exactly with what we're talking about. See, the indefinite article is added in front of it. Instead of God, they call him a God. All right, so what do you mean? Well, that's the Demiurge. That's the Demiurge. That's the lesser God. That's Jehovah of the Old Testament. Now, have you noticed how that, they, that, uh, that everybody's changing Jehovah to Yahweh? Yeah. All right, and I know some good people. I, there's some men that I respect that call him Yahweh. I know that's a big deal. It's a very contentious thing. But, uh, you know, the Jehovah's Witnesses haven't changed. If they're still Jehovah's Witnesses, not Yahweh Witnesses. <laughs> Jehovah is the product of taking Adonai, the Masoretes took the vowel points, Masoretic vowel points, and put it over the tetragrammaton, yod he vowel he, and by doing that, they produced Jehovah. All right. Now here's the problem. The Jews had the school of the Masoretes. The school of the Masoretes' purpose was to lock the Scripture in place. They were very, very concerned that the next generation would get an exact copy of what they had in their hand. Is there anything wrong with that? No. That's called the preservation of Scripture. They had a school that did that called the Sulfurim. The Sulfurim were under the control of it were under the control of the Jews to be certain that every scripture, every word, every letter was locked in place. And by doing that, then they could preserve the scripture because the scrolls would wear out and preserve it for the next generation. The Masoretes, the Masoretes are the Jewish school who had to do with the preservation of Scripture and the transmission of Scripture so somebody could read it. What do you mean by that? If you had a Hebrew Old Testament in your hand right now with Masoretic vowel points on it, you'd have little dots and little dashes around the letters. That's what you use to pronounce the letters. If you don't have those Masoretic vowel points and simply have the Jewish Hebrew consonants, you don't have a clue how to pronounce it. Now, here's the mystery. They did. They could read it and pronounce it without any, without any vowel points. 2,000 years ago, Masoretic vowel points did not exist. They were so locked into their scriptures, they were so dedicated to their word, that they could take a Bible and they could read that scripture and they could read those letters and they knew exactly what they were reading. But a Gentile didn't have a clue. Now what does that tell you? That tells you that the Jew had within his power the preservation of the word of God and the Gentile was out. See what I mean? You cannot, pro you cannot pronounce a word without vowels. It's impossible. A E I O U sometimes Y N W. You've got to have those vowels in there somewhere. Or you cannot pronounce that word. If all you have is consonants, okay, like G, P, uh, uh, R, something like that, and you put those letters together, you're just looking at, you don't know what you're looking at. You have to have vowels in there to create a letter. Now, here's what happened the Masoretes, about 1,000, 1100 AD, somewhere along in there, the Masoretes, Jews, 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 took a system of dots, dashes, dagesh forne, forte, dagesh line, comma I know you've never heard terms like that, and they don't really mean anything to you, but what they are, they're vowels. They put those dots and dashes over the letters or under the letters so that you 
and their children could read the Old Testament Scriptures. That's what it means. This is why you've heard it referred to as the Masoretic Text. Have you ever heard that? That's what it's talking about. It's talking about a Hebrew text that has Masoretic vowel points attached to it, as, as compared to one that doesn't. Now, here's the problem. When they took those Masoretic vowel points and they took the holiest name in the Bible, the Tetragrammaton, four letters, Yod, He, Vow, He, they're consonants. You can't pronounce it. It's unpronounceable unless you know how to pronounce it. If you're a Jew living 2,000 years ago, you would know exactly how to pronounce it. But here's the catch. You won't pronounce it because it is so holy. When you come across that four consonants, you see the tetragrammaton, you say Adonai. Adonai means Lord. And here's what the Jews did. They took the vowel points, the Masoretic vowel points, and put them on yod he vow he. And when they did that, then that is read in English or any other language as Yehovah, Jehovah. That's where we get the word Jehovah. But here's what's happened. They've come along now, and they've said, you see, these Jews are messing with your mind. They're wrong. It should be Yahweh. A complete change of the vowel points. It's all about the tetragrammaton now. It's all about that again. But they've changed it completely, and it's saying now it's Yahweh. And I'm going to have to stop with that, but I'm going to make you think. I'm going to make you think. Now, I went through a long thing to tell you how I got that. And there's a reason for it. Now, why such a big dogfight between Jehovah and Yahweh today? You reckon there may be a motive behind that? I mean, what's going on? Just ask a few questions. The word Jehovah didn't seem to have any trouble with Christians for a long time, did it? I was taught from a child, Jehovah, that's his name, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Sidkenu, Jehovah Shalom, the Jehovistic combinations in the Old Testament. It's all great, heard a thousand messages on it, all wonderful. Now it is Yahweh Jireh, Yahweh uh, Sidkenu, Yahweh Shalom. See, it's changed. Why? Anytime something changes like that, I immediately ask myself the question, why'd you do that? You know, Pardon? It certainly creates confusion. And I say again now, there are some good men, men that I have great respect for, that are saying Yahweh now. And I'm not telling you they're demon-possessed <coughs> at all, but I am telling you, when something changes like that, there's got to be a reason here. There's something going on. You might want to study it a little further and do a little research into it and find out what's, what's happening. If you find out something, let us know. Man, we're, this, we, this Sunday school class is ready for anything. <laughs> if, you, if you found something, bring it in here and bring it up. <laughs> and we'll at least talk about it if we don't do anything else. Uh, I'd like to hear. I'd like to hear somebody that's put a little effort into it and study. Because I've read some good work, very good work, that supports Jehovah. Supports it. Amen. All right, we'll have word prayer and we'll let you go. And we'll meet again next Sunday, Lord willing. Uh, Brother Valance, will you just miss this I'm Jared Christ's Heavenly Father, Lord. Lord, we're so grateful that we have a book, the Holy Bible, that we can count on, Lord, that we yes. don't have to doubt, we don't have to have any kind of reservations about what it says, but we can trust it. And Lord, we're thankful we have a God that we can trust, and a God that saves us to the uttermost. Lord, we're thankful for this Sunday school class, and we're thankful for what our pastor is teaching us, Lord, and preparing yes. us yes. for the deception that's coming. It's already here. Lord, I pray that you'll bless it. And Lord, I pray for those souls in this building today that are without Christ, that your Holy Spirit will work and deal with their, their hearts and bring them to repentance. For us in Jesus Christ, our blessed Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen.